Okay, um, so all our presenters are currently in our Zoom um, session. And I am the moderator for our first round table today. That's the round table on, on diversity in ancient studies. Um, to start with, let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Ling Xing Zhan. I recently fin finished my PhD in Egyptology with a focus on the Greek Roman period, and I now teach ancient Egyptian languages at New Haven. Uh, our round table today focuses on diversity in ancient studies. These round tables are intended as forums for those who are interested in proactively developing real solutions to these problems. We view them as working groups to convene and begin to outline practical steps for solutions that will be taken up by future collaborations to truly open the ancient world to all. Lack of diversity in ancient studies fields uh, is a well-acknowledged problem. Many fields within ancient studies developed through colonialist endeavors and allowed limited access to only particular social groups via elitist schools. Over the past several decades, strides have been made to begin to transform the attitudes and practices surrounding the notion of who uh, belongs in studying the deep past. Sasa, S.A., S.A., and Digital Hammurabi envision a new ancient studies in which all are not only welcome, but also actively incorporated into the study of the deep past of all places and cultures. So please join us and bring your ideas so we can pull our efforts and make real changes together. Uh, to participate in our discussion today, you can put your comments in the chat during the speaker's mini presentation or after the mini presentation. And I'll ask people to unmute themselves um, to start our dialogue. So our first speaker today is David. Um, so, David, I'm sure a lot of you, if you have been um, participating in this weekend's conference are familiar with him. David is a PhD candidate at New York University's Institute for the Study of the Ancient World, studying ancient Near Eastern history and in particular, the changing identities of immigrants in the sixth to the fifth century BCE Babylonian. David is the creator and lead researcher of the NEH granted Shanati project, which is working to reconstruct the ancient Babylonian chronology of the first millennium BCE to the day. He is also the founder and director of SESA, Save Ancient Studies Alliance. Uh, so David, I will pass the mic to you. Thank you so much, Ling Shen. Okay, first of all, I'd like to invite everybody to turn on your cameras so we can all see each other face to face. I'm going to leave this in speaker mode so people can see um, who's speaking, but you can thumb through the gallery also to see who else is on. Um, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat. Um, also, I just wanted to mention first that to everyone that we are streaming live so people outside of the Zoom can see our discussion. And I'm gonna drop in this chat the link to a Google Doc, um, which is going to have notes of the round table taken in it. It's only open for your viewing, but so everybody can see um, the comments and discussion and questions that people have, um, because we really wanna take this seriously and work towards building solutions together um, to the problems that we're discussing. Um, today, the issues of diversity in ancient studies and at tomorrow's round table, um, how to build a broader community of scholars, both people who are in and outside of academia as one unified community in ancient studies. So in thinking about how um, SASA approaches dealing with the issues of diversity in ancient studies and really trying to work towards opening up ancient studies to everyone. Um, we first naturally take a proactive approach. 
um, of trying to court people of all different backgrounds and all different contexts and all different occupations. One way in which we're doing that is through our outreach team. Our outreach team is sort of our first um, handle on connecting to people out there. Um, they are a bunch of committed volunteers who look for ways of, for different people to get in touch with on, on different um, areas and arenas of life and then engage them in the various projects that we're working on. Another major way um, that SASA addresses uh, the issue of diversity is by trying to expand access to ancient studies, access to knowledge about the ancient world, access to um, learning about the ancient world in educational contexts and in informal contexts and in working um, people's way into um, higher education and supporting them along the way. So we have several projects that we've been running um, that help to, to do this. Um, one uh, that I'd like, uh, well, I'll point out several right now. One is our text and translation reading groups. So these are discussion groups that we've run this summer um, that are running now and last summer and in January. And the idea is that people can bring themselves to the text to a small group of discussants in a Zoom, a private Zoom that's led by a, um, a PhD student or someone with a PhD in the, in the related field that, um, that the topic is about. And they read and prepare the text in an English translation. We actually just had a Spanish language group this summer and we can, um, are aiming to continue to expand to other languages as well. And without having knowledge of ancient texts, they can engage with them directly in a uh, friendly environment and with people of all different ages and backgrounds. And I've sat in on a bunch of them and they're really, really amazing. Uh, another area that we started working on is to provide resources to people who are interested in the ancient world. So um, we actually just made public a couple of days ago, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat, um, a new database on our website of ancient studies resources. If you're looking at the website, you can look at, find it under the, in the nav bar under the resources drop down. This currently is a database of over 900 websites in a variety of ancient studies fields that are aimed at providing good, accurate, interesting content to people who are interested in studying the ancient world and in growing their knowledge and in researching. Um, and we're very thankful to the wonderful access team at SASA that has been working on this for a long time. Um, big shout out to John Haverstro, um, who has been leading this team. I think he's on the call somewhere there. He can uh, wave or something, I don't know. Um, and also to all the wonderful volunteers who are on this team who have been helping and hunting for these great websites that we found um, really in fields spanning from ancient Siberia to ancient Americas to ancient Near East, my specialty. Um, <laughs> um, in particular, I wanna point out and thank you, Selena Bebenek and Patrick Griselli who have both really dedicated a lot of time to uh, hunting these, for these websites and uh, really helping create a, a great resource. And we continue to expect to continue to work on that. Okay, now that I've talked too long, I want to present an idea about ancient studies that I'm hoping we can discuss. And this idea is um, something we've thrown around at SASA. Um, it's the point is to help bring diversity into ancient studies from the ground up. Um, and we think that one of the best ways of doing that is engaging young students of all backgrounds. So we've developed um, a concept that we're hoping will continue to grow. Uh, it's a very new concept and we don't have that much in it. So we're looking for your help. Um, the concept is, is the SASA ambassador. And by that we mean a middle school or high school teacher or a community college professor who prioritizes ancient studies in their teaching and wants to find a way to engage students both in and outside the classroom um, to engage them in 
ancient world and ancient studies more. So I'm very interested to hear um, if people have ideas about how we could develop the idea of the SASA ambassador, um, of giving teachers tools to be able to do this. Um, I think the format is that if we're, if anybody wants to uh, make a comment or ask a question or say something, please drop it in the chat and Ling Shan will call on you. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. If you wish to respond to the question David raised, please uh, type in your comments in the chat. So um, we have a follow-up question, David. Um, Julia, you want to unmute yourself to share your question with the rest of the group? Yeah, sure. Hi. Um, so I guess I just wanted to know a little bit more about the program. So would these ambassadors be folks who are already sort of effectively, actively, robustly teaching ancient Near East in their classes? or people who want to have some guidance um, as to best practices, resources to grow their, their, their classes and to grow their curriculum? Well, first of all, I would say that this is uh, for teachers who are teaching social studies and history uh, in the ancient or pre-modern context in general, but um, it could be either direction. Um, other teachers who, who feel like they have good competence but are looking for extra tools, or teachers who um, are interested but don't have the tools at all. And if anybody has other ideas of things, topic, things to discuss about how to improve diversity practically in ancient studies, please, please uh, speak up or drop it in the chat. We have a, a lot of comments coming in. So I'm gonna um, just call on Greta, because um, they have a perspective as a librarian. Uh, Greta, you want to unmute yourself and share your comments with us? Yes, I mean, I'm so excited to participate in this conference. And I, I will say, helping researchers and students at the college and university level, one of the hesitations that people have when they are passionate and enthusiastic about this is that they are not always, con and I think this can apply to the middle school and college professors, is that they're not confident. And so one of the things that the resources do and instruction about pedagogy and approaches is gonna do is to make people who do care and do want to teach and do want to do the kind of outreach you want in this ambassadors program to have the tools, I guess I'm focusing on the confidence to do this kind of work. So I love this database. I think it's very exciting. Thank you so much, Greta. Um, I will call on, I see that Steph, both Stefan and Solange have some experiences to share with the rest of us. Uh, Stefan, you wanna unmute yourself and share your comments? Sure, hi. So I teach uh, sixth grade language arts in an urban district in New Jersey and Passaic. I don't know if anybody knows uh, where that is, but anyway, um, we do do a unit on you know, ancient Greek mythology and such. And we teach Percy Jackson, which I don't like. I don't like the book, but I, I like the opportunity because, you know, I studied classics uh, extensively in college. And I mean, I have Achilles in Greek on my arm. Um, so I, I use it as a way to just throw as much like real stuff at them as possible. And they're very interested in it. And so one thing I've been doing all summer, I've been to a number of these, uh, you know, webinars, conferences, whatever, trying to find ways that young urban youth can relate even more because they love the stories, but I'm, I'm interested in how it can relate to their world. 
Yeah, definitely to create relevant uh, and interesting and engaging content, right? Uh, Solange, uh, do you want to share your experience with the rest of the group? Sure. Yeah, I'll just second what Greta said. Um, we just started an organization called the William Leo Hansberry Society a year ago on July 4th, and it's a group of Black scholars who uh, research ancient Africa, at this point, Northeast Africa. And so we've had a handful of elementary school teachers reach out to us to try to get better uh, training, a better grasp about what is Nubia, since that uh, is just sort of coming to people's consciousness recently. And so I'll just mention my colleague, Deborah Hurd, has been really good about um, putting a lot of time and energy into running seminars for those um, teachers. And I think that that's really powerful. People want it to talk about Nubia, but pretty much nobody, including Egyptologists, knows anything about <laughs> Nubia. And so there's a lot of um, education that needs to be done. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so we, uh, in, in the comment section, Melissa Matthews uh, mentioned that uh, there might be a need to conduct a survey, so to better create engaging contents. Uh, Melissa, you wanna share this comment with, with us? Sure, so um, I'm actually researching right now with Sasa um, how to decolonize ancient studies. Um, so it's very interesting to me to, to hear all these questions from teachers about how do we teach this subject or, um, and from my perspective, hearing what you need as a teacher to teach um, different methods and different cultures and different ideas. Um, so for me, uh, decolonizing the syllabi is first and foremost, I come from a philosophy and a anthropology background. Um, so that's key for me. But um, as a researcher for SASA, I would love to be able to just ask teachers generally because I can see how it might change based on area, East Coast, West Coast, Southern. There, there's so many different um, methods that um, might be, we just need to, to ask about to see what, what would work for different teachers in different areas. Um, yeah, so if we could make that happen, that would be great. So on the topic of uh, surveying, uh, uh, running a survey of different topics of interest and in creating syllabi, we actually have uh, two related comments. The first comment is from Anna Goldfield. Uh, Anna, do you wanna share your insights uh, with regard to syllabi creating with the rest of the group? Well, it was just more of a question um, because if this would this would be a step that would come after the sort of survey step where teachers would indicate what they needed but in terms of the available resources it would be neat to kind of create small kind of modular syllabi that could be put together given what a teacher is teaching so if it's social studies or if it's languages things like that so if you're teaching k through maybe not k through 12 grades 6 through 12 languages here are resources that are most relevant for you right so like kind of packaging things for teachers um just like a tiny moment of, of tooting my own horn and spoiler for a, a presentation that's coming out tomorrow but um i'm one half of the dirt podcast and we do something very similar where we um any episode that we have that might intersect with an archaeology 101 topic we've included it in a modular syllabus for teachers um that's you know if you're teaching gender studies here's this might be good for you if you're teaching sort of ancient history of different civilizations here's the episodes that we've done that are relevant so something along a similar vein um we found has had good um you know, reasonably good success and, and we've gotten some feedback that it's been helpful. So um, structuring things like that as a resource after uh, after finding out what sort of thing is needed, you know, after after the surveying process could be one avenue to pursue. Thank you, Anna, so much for your um, for your thoughts and comments. Uh, so there are more, there are many more comments in the chat and uh, just a 
just for example, there are questions about whether we should uh, expand this project to include K-12 students or into high schools. Um, and uh, and we we hope that we can continue this conversation uh, even after our panel today. But right now, just to respect everyone's time, we do have to move on to our second presenter today. And our second presenter um, is the um, is the queer classicist Yento Love. Uh, Yento Love graduated from Cardiff University in 2019 with a degree in ancient history and has since been awarded an MA in classics and ancient history from the University of Exeter. She is passionate about ancient concepts of gender and sexuality and is currently in the process of applying for a PhD. In her free time, she runs the website The Career Classicist with the goal of making ancient history seem accessible, sexy, and fun. Uh, all right, Yento, um, welcome, welcome you. Take over. Great. Um, thank you very much for that um, introduction. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Perfect. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen? Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. Thanks again for that great introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be joining in, uh, talking with everyone about how we can use outreach in order to increase diversity within ancient studies. Um, I'm aware that there are time constraints with this chat, so I'm just going to jump right in. Okay, so firstly, to consider who we as scholars of ancient studies are trying to reach out to, who isn't here already in the field of discussion when we're talking about ancient studies, and who might feel excluded by classics and ancient history in its current form. If we're talking about outreach in terms of ancient history and classical studies, one of the most important aspects of outreach is that you meet um, you bring your service to the user, you're meeting them where they already are. So that's a really vital point, I think, to lead with in regards to our audience. You know, diversity, diversifying published articles behind a paywall is great, but it does still remain inaccessible to a lot of people. Instead, what we can do is look at where people already enjoy learning and reach out to them there. Another thing with this is working to challenge what I'm going to call the elitism of form, meaning this idea that the only valuable education can come through a lecture or an article. Instead, I think we should try and broaden our horizons for how we can disseminate knowledge and spark an interest in the ancient world and ancient studies. Now that we've reached this potential new audience, uh, how do we continue to engage with them and spark an interest in ancient studies? I would argue that this comes through the recognition of diversity, and I'm going to lay out three specific ways in which we can do that. Firstly, uh, demonstrate the diversity of classical reception show them why ancient studies are still relevant and all the places where references to antiquity are clearly visible in modern culture. Whether this is through games, like the Assassin's Creed Odyssey here, um, music videos or high fashion editorials, the influence of antiquity is everywhere in our consumer culture and they will have definitely already encountered it. So show this to them explain the ancient history that they are seeing in everything that they consume and explain it to them. Um, secondly, diversify our own scholarship. And what I mean by this is champion ideas that up until more recently were shared on the site Eidolon. Uh, so use the lens of ancient studies to talk about modern issues and interests making antiquity relevant to the modern day. 
whether it's through sharing the relationship between ancient art and cartoons, Greek gods and pop stars, uh, ancient sex toys and sexuality, or how heavy metal music makes use of classical imagery by taking subjects that young diverse audiences are fascinated by and by then linking them to antiquity, it has the potential to spark a much deeper interest in ancient studies as a whole. The final aspect in this three-step plan is through demonstrating the diversity of the ancient world. Firstly, uh, let's challenge the Eurocentricity of traditional classics, a view steeped in white supremacist ideologies by expanding our view of the ancient world to the ancient peoples of Africa, Asia and the Americas. As um, Solange Ashby mentioned earlier, um, there are far more civilizations to talk about than just what we focus in on the ancient Mediterranean, you know, Greece, Rome, sometimes if you're lucky, a bit of Egypt thrown in. And people really want to learn about it and haven't learned about it. And so that is something that we should bring to the forefront of our scholarly explorations, just really opening people's eyes to these amazing histories of the world that have long gone um, untalked about. Secondly, people are interested in learning more about histories they can see themselves in. Show your audience how racially diverse ancient populations were and destroy the idea that all Romans were white, which we see cropping up on Twitter basically every week, it seems like. Um, turn to contemporary political issues. We're currently seeing a shocking rise in also supported by pseudo-scientific and pseudo-historic claims. We can challenge this by demonstrating the history of gender diversity within antiquity and at the same time demonstrating to our LGBT plus audiences that they are present in this history too. Ancient studies should be for everyone and so we need to actively demonstrate this to our audience. The ancient world wasn't full of all straight and white people and so we need to employ illustrations, writing and other educational tools to really express this. Um, I'm aware of the time constraints on us, but I just want to quickly take a moment to highlight some of the main points um, because I know we've really rushed through this topic. So firstly, the importance of taking ancient studies to the audience, not expecting people to come to us. Find which platforms are the most accessible to people and work with them. Secondly, emphasizing diversity, whether that's in the wide range of references to antiquity through pop culture, opening up topics of scholarship to more inclusive and relevant discussions, or emphasizing the diversity of people living in the ancient world. It's all extremely vital to creating a more diverse scholarly environment that makes people really excited to be a part of it. Um, I'm really looking forward to speaking to you all in the discussion after this presentation, but if anyone wants to reach me later online uh, to share specific thoughts or questions, you can always find me on Twitter um, at Queer Classicist or through my website, uh, thequeerclassicist.com. And yeah, that's... Uh, all that I have to say. I'm looking forward to discussing it with you. Thank you so much, Yanto, for that fascinating um, presentation. And I completely agree. Once we start looking for ancient culture and their influence on our more modern society, we'll find that they're everywhere, right? Uh, so due to co time constraint, we might only have time to uh, two or three comments or questions. Um, so if you have questions, please type it in the chat box. Um, Amber, you wanna join us by uh, joining the conversation by unmuting yourself? Uh, sure, yeah, and I'll just relate what I put in the chat for everyone. Um, thank you so much for the, the thoughts that you shared just now, um, brilliant. Um, and I just wanted to call additional attention uh, to your point about seeing oneself in antiquity. 
that, that people respond to that. And that's so valuable. And, and I just want to sort of um, lean into that and say that the same goes for seeing oneself among those studying antiquity, that, um, you know, it, it, I, it, perhaps it may like feel trite to some at this point, but representation matters. And, and so, you know, we hear that a lot and it can sometimes be hollow when it's said, but it is, it is absolutely crucial because if, um, it, one, we, we risk making it look like all of us are sort of subscribing to the same um, colonial white heteropatriarchal like narratives and that this is something to aspire to and that um, those from um, other backgrounds or who do not see themselves in those narratives are in some way um, participating in it still. And so I think that there's something to be said about um, what you're looking for in the past in your research, uh, but also who you're looking to uh, among who's doing it. Um, that's something that's been a big part of my work. Um, I'm the other half of the DIRT podcast, uh, but also um, that's something that's been really um, uh, change, like life changing in my in my own career and my own trajectory of seeing people who um, I can recognize have um, backgrounds not unlike mine who are who do who see value in in the work, uh, and I think that that's um, that cannot be stressed enough about the the importance of that. So thank you again uh, for what for what you've shared here. It gives us a lot to think about. And thank you, Amber, for sharing that speech with us. Um, in the chat, Stephen made uh, a comment about uh, creating a space that's inclusive for LGBTQ community students. Uh, Stephen, you want to uh, join, uh, unmute yourself? Sure. Um, so uh, this is something I've been struggling with because I'm noticing, despite the fact that we're in New Jersey and we passed laws recently, requiring, you know, the inclusion of LGBT in the, in the community, in the curriculum, there's a lot of pushback from students. And there's, unfortunately, there's a lot of pushback from teachers. And, you know, when I'm the guy with the, the pride flag on my door, and you notice that some teachers aren't in on it, some students, I mean, uh, a lot of students are, need help, but there are, the, my point is that the kids don't feel comfortable yet even though we're supposed to be making them feel included and supposed to be making them feel comfortable. You know, kids come to me and a, a couple other teachers, but for the, by and large, you know, or you go to a, you know, um, a faculty meeting and you hear people venting, well, why are we teaching? The level? You know, uh, so <laughs> I, I think my point is that I like anything that reinforces inclusion. And if you can like, you know, point out that stuff, like, um, Yentl was saying, I think that's just great. And I'm, you know, that's a goal of mine for this year is to just make the community more inclusive in the school because these kids are coming here and they don't feel accepted at home and they, they really need to feel accepted somewhere. Yeah, thank you so much for that comment and thank you for, for the work. Um, I see that there is no more comments uh, and thank you again for our presenter, Yentl. Um, and for your fascinating work. Well, let's move on to our second presenter of the day, Amelia Dahl. Uh, so Amelia is, the, is a deaf archeologist currently working as a seasonal for the Bureau of Land Management in Colorado. And she obtained a master of arts in archeology span from Texas State University. Amelia is also on the board of deaf culture and history section of the National Association of the Deaf as a chair, as well as a commissioner for Colorado Commission of the Deaf, Hard of Hearing and Deafblind, and most recently a founding member of Disabled Archaeologists Network. Her long-term personal project is to gather resources on archaeological research regarding deaf people in ancient history. Uh, a, well, a warm welcome to Amelia.
having some slight technical difficulties, everyone. Uh, we can't actually find Amelia's interpreter uh, in the Zoom call. So give us a minute just to try and, and find her so that we can unmute her and Amelia can present. David, can you say, can you see a phone number on anyone's account anywhere? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for your patience. And we can see Amelia as okay, well. Okay, so yeah, I just have to shares, unmute we'll myself too. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't worry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, all right, that is new to me. <laughs> okay, so before I present my discussion, I would like to emphasize that by mentioning people's names and or making criticizing statements does not mean it's a way for others to cancel, but a way to recognize the issues and to improve. And I just wanted to make sure everybody kind of understands, um, you know, what I mean a little more. So pretty often, I mean, for example, you can get, I mean, when you ask um, for the resources or this research or whatever, you know, somebody may not be paying attention um, or they just don't really care about the syllabus, I guess, and including that diversity is very important and including disabilities in that diversity is so rare. So is there, is there enough of that at all? Is disability included in diversity even a little bit? <laughs> um, not really. Um, you know, and whether they ask if there are enough presenters of diversity include disabled, you know, saying I didn't pay attention. So the common denominator when it comes to research in ancient studies is most do not pay attention to where, what, why of the sources provided. Ignorance is defined as the lack of knowledge or information. And it does happen in the field of ancient studies, unfortunately. The Associated Scholars at UPenn Center for Ancient Studies are composed of mostly white people with no obvious recognition towards diversity. The Graduate Student-Led Collaborative Society for Ancient Studies at NYU are also composed of mostly white people. The Diversity Committee from Association of Ancient Historians have two people of a different race on the board. However, um, it is chartered by a white woman with apparently no research or experience in diversity by my knowledge and research so far. Paying attention also requires critical thinking. How many more universities, societies, organizations, workshops, conferences, etc., of ancient studies profession do not ensure di diversity and inclusivity.
paying attention does not require much of a person's time. It is, however, a genuine effort to develop a habit of identifying and recognizing the absence of diversity. The pay attention is essential to improve diversity in agent studies. Before I present my discussion, I would like to one moment, please. Sorry, one moment for the interpreter. So paying attention does not require much of a person's time. However, to pay attention is essential to improve diversity in ancient studies. All right, that is all. Uh, thank you so much, Amelia. I think uh, the Amelia's presentation just now reminds us how important representation is, and in the time or the space that the representation is uh, is still lacking, uh, it is important that we pay attention to the question of the and I, right? So now we're opening up the chat for any comments and questions. Um, so feel free to type your thoughts in there. Great. Uh, so Greta has, Greta and Stefan has uh, shared two comments in the chat. Uh, so Greta, you want to uh, share the thoughts out loud with the rest of the group? Um, yes, please. I just want to make sure that everybody, I was writing so fast, I couldn't keep up with it. Um, did I have this correctly? Paying attention doesn't take much of a person's time. Paying attention is crucial to ensuring diversity in ancient studies. Is that correct? Okay, great. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you. That's good. I'm going to put it as a banner um, in my signature. Thank you, dear. Great. Uh, Stefan? Yeah, I just, I took uh, paying attention as, you know, you need to be thinking about all the time who's being represented, who's being included, who are you maybe not including as much as you should? It's something you have to be active about. You can't, you know, do a lesson one day and pat yourself on the back and then become complacent. You got to constantly be, you know, researching and paying attention to what's going on in the community and incorporating from there. So you can't just ever say, hey, I'm, I'm the best diverse teacher. I'm so great. Ha ha ha. You, you can't stop. That's such a wonderful point. Uh, it's almost like the terminology of being culturally competent, or uh, as if it's a it's an ability you can achieve and acquire and perfect, right? But uh, usually, like in reality, that's not how cultural awareness works. Uh, so, thank you so much for those comments. 
Okay, so we are going to move on to the last presenter uh, of today's roundtable, Jeremy Brooks. Jeremy Brooks is, is the founder of AVROD Virtual Archaeology. Uh, Averald is the Archaeological Virtual Reality Online Database, and it is a global VR platform for exploring and disseminating archaeological sites through fully immersive VR technologies. To date, uh, uh, Avrod has over 50 real-world photogram uh, photogrammetric locations that the community members can explore remotely. Their goal is to digitize and disseminate the world's cultural heritage while creating a social online space for public and academic uh, users to share their thoughts and ideas about history on location. Uh, Jeremy Brooks lives in Canada. He holds an MA in digital archaeology, and his current research focuses on digital archaeology, spatial and visual learning, AR, VR technologies, and abroad. He also enjoys playing the drums. All right. Uh, welcome, Jeremy Brooks. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Uh, thank you so much for having me and for uh, David for the invitation. Um, I was asked to prepare a three minute presentation. So that's exactly what I've done. Um, let me just share my screen here. I don't really use Zoom <laughs> strangely, so let me know if everyone can see my screen. Can I get a thumbs up? Yeah. Uh, is that a yes, David? OK, great. Thank you. <laughs> I can only see you on my screen mostly. Um, let me just go ahead and start this. Okay, so get that out of the way. I uh, don't know how to minimize Zoom. Uh, you might have to bear with me for the bottom half. Okay, anyways, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, go through it. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, so Avrod is uh, the Archaeological Virtuality Online Database. Uh, currently, it is a free virtuality platform accessible on three gaming app stores, uh, including uh, Steam, Viveport, and SideQuest, and we're hoping to get onto uh, the, the official Quest store uh, in the coming future. Um, I'll explain what all that means in a moment. Um, so Avrod uh, is the, as I was saying, the Archaeological Virtuality Online Database. Um, so this started actually from my master's project uh, trying to solve issues of accessing archaeological data and traveling to World Heritage sites uh, when traveling would be an issue. Um, so it is dedicated to digitizing World Heritage and archaeology, and we're looking to democratize access to virtual reality, uh, sorry, to archaeological sites, um, enhance learning through visualization and changing the way people um, work and learn through online collaboration and enhancing to access to scientific information and uh, other relevant things that are difficult to get just from like a scholarly article or or something published online. Um, so that's the big thing that we're trying to accomplish. Um, Avrod essentially started from my interest in Turkey. Um, I was looking to go to Gobekli Tepe, which didn't happen because of the conflict in Syria. And so around the same time, I was introduced to VR actually at a cafe and kind of the idea started from there back in 2016. So we've been developing it ever since uh, from Ontario, Canada. We also have a lot of members internationally uh, who and volunteers. We work primarily with students uh, and such that uh, have given us their time um, to develop the platform, which we're very grateful for. Um, so we are developing it for virtual reality only at the moment. And primarily we've developed it for the HTC 5, which you can see there on the left. Uh, and we're also hoping to release it for the Oculus Quest 2, which is a new headset owned by Facebook. And I'll get into the complications of, of or the trickiness of that later, I should say, um, and developing for growing VR markets uh, as the hardware right now currently isn't accessible to most people. It is getting cheaper. And uh, if anyone has any questions about that, I'll be happy to answer that later uh, through things like the Oculus Quest. Um, oh, with that said, we're also hoping to eventually create a desktop compatible version. Um, there are a number of VR platforms out there right now that have successfully done this. Uh, so essentially, it is very similar to computer gaming, uh, except you're actually interacting with people who are in VR as avatars. Um, but that won't be for some time. Um, so for now, it's just virtual reality. Um, so for my master's project, I didn't really want to spend too much time talking about that, but I digitized a site in Canada and talked a little bit about photogrammetric processes. And I can always um, send a link to an interview recently that I had on the radio 
or on a podcast rather, and we kind of talked a little bit about that. So um, I'm just gonna skip over just the VR side of things for this. Um, essentially what we do is we pull um, photogrammetric archeological sites that are currently accessible online through websites such as Sketchfab, and we put them into virtual reality spaces um, to accomplish certain goals. And some of those goals I'll talk to towards the end of the presentation. Um, so these are all real locations that are digitized using a camera, digital camera. I use a GoPro a lot when I was in Europe and I digitized part of the Coliseum and it's actually not that difficult. Um, so a lot of people are doing this now and they're publishing these online, uh, archeologists and researchers and just people who enjoy uh, photogrammetry in their spare time. So they're all actually very accurate models. Uh, photogrammetry um, understands the, the distance and shapes of objects and represents that in the 3D models as well. So if you can properly scale things, it's actually very close, uh, usually between a few centimeters or a few millimeters to the actual object in the real world. Um, so that's what we're primarily looking to do. And here we just have an example of a, a Mayan glyph, um, which you can actually stand in front of and uh, kind of experience in virtual reality as there's a lot of spatial and visual components. It's hard to, it really doesn't do justice to explain it over a call. It's something you really have to try. Um, but it is very similar to a feeling that we currently can reproduce of actually standing at a site or experiencing an archeological location. Um, so currently what we have right now is access to about 51 sites. We're hoping to publish another four or five, including uh, the Lincoln Memorial, uh, the Sistine Chapel, um, the Pantheon Dome, uh, so just the interior and uh, the White House grounds. Um, so we can talk a little bit about that after I didn't include anything in the slide because it's still a work in progress, um, but I can show you some of the work we've done already. Um, so essentially you log in, I do have a video at the end if we have time to show it, and you are presented in front of this big globe and you can hold your controller up, um, such as these are the controllers you hold in your hand and uh, point it at the globe and you can pick a site and travel to that site if it's available in the database. Um, so that's kind of what we started with, just being able to access archeological data remotely and really explore things where, where it's difficult for people to do that. Um, as it's really easy to digitize a lot of these sites, but very often they don't really have anywhere to go and they just end up on these websites and you can kind of click at them, look around, or if you're lucky, you've got a Google cardboard and kind of look at it, but those are very limited um, experientially and spatially. Uh, and functionally, actually, for that matter, um, and, and how you can learn and share information from that. Um, so just some of our sites, uh, these are actually, majority of them are actually to scale. Um, so the Arc de Triomphe, I did my very best to get it exactly at the height. It's quite a large structure, so that took some time. Uh, we also have Tiwatiwakan, Apollo 11. Uh, so a lot of these have been published by people um, just trying to get the information out and, and share the information. Um, we have a site down here in, in Tanis, Egypt, where I think one of the ministers of antiquity publishes these and posts them. Um, so we request access to the models and then we spend some time actually creating the lighting and putting them in environments. And then we publish them through the platform, uh, which you can download if you have a headset and, and go through uh, right now. Um, so just some more of our sites, uh, including the Robert Gaskin here, which is in Ontario. Uh, a real shipwreck underwater. Um, we've also recently, I, I spent about four months <laughs> painstakingly trying to upgrade all the sites uh, to high definition um, because we were getting a lot of complaints of, you know, the scenes aren't finished or things don't look the certain way I expected from some of our users. Um, these are VR users, so a lot of them are gamers. Um, so we really wanted to upgrade that to improve the experiential function of it. Um, so everything you see can be explored in virtual reality and seen up close um, and is pretty close to scale. Um, we also have some literature on site, which you can access to learn a little bit more about it. And I'll go over that in a minute. Um, so here we have the Robert Gaskin. This took, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot his name who created it. Uh, it took him about two years, an archaeologist in Canada, to photograph. And then he published it for free on Sketchfab. We then credit to the authors by creating a link back to their Sketchfab page. So it turns into kind of like a virtual reality equivalent to like a scholarly article where you just reference sources. And that's kind of what we're doing with the, with the models, which is why we've been able to publish uh, as many as we have. Um, so everything that we have in the platform is credited to the creators. Um, and we also provide extra information so people can stand and, and read about these sites. Um, this is the Sistine Chapel. Some of them are actually artistically recreated. Um, so the Sistine Chapel was uh, recreated by an artist and then sold online, which we then purchased. And then um, for legal reasons, we can 
use it however we wish. Um, so, but most of them, again, we just follow a lot of the Creative Commons rules. And so the models are primarily uh, Creative Commons 4.0, which is public domain, um, or for commercial purposes, because technically Avrod is a company to start up, and uh, it's also a big platform for sharing this information. Um, beyond that, uh, we just have more sites here. Uh, we've created a lot of these um, environments, and uh, again, the models and, and information is, is accurate to what it is in the real world. Uh, we've also started experimenting with virtual museums. Um, obviously due to COVID, museums uh, were very difficult to access uh, for many people, including here in Ontario. Um, so what we did was we requested access to, uh, this was in Sweden, um, these particular artifacts, and then we provided information from as many reputable sources as we could uh, to actually allow people to stand there, read about the information and uh, understand it spatially as well. So just going through some more sites, we have the Oval Office, and uh, again, some of them are artistically recreated. Uh, we do let users know if that's the case, because then they aren't going to be exactly perfect to what it is in real life, um, or they are photogrammetric, and we let the user know as well. Um, so this is just a before or after. Uh, this was like my spring project, was just kind of upgrading everything, and uh, we haven't actually published this yet, uh, but we're hoping to uh, in the next few weeks or so. Uh, if we can get everything optimized properly. Um, we also are updating our globe room, uh, like I showed you a picture at the beginning. And uh, what we're doing is we're replacing a research center that this can become kind of like uh, a hangout space for uh, anybody who uses Avrod so that you can interact with other users, talk about archaeology, get excited about it together, and then travel to those sites as well. Um, and that's obviously open to academics. We would love, you know, all peoples of all communities to actually uh, be integrated in using this type of platform. Um, and the technology will get cheaper and cheaper um, as all technology does and more accessible. Um, so we're really kind of setting this up now so that in five or six years time, just like how everyone got smartphones 10 years ago, we're hoping the same will happen with VR headsets um, as they get cheaper and cheaper. Um, so that's kind of our approach to this and uh, just making things accessible by just putting it out there online. We've also started working with archeologists, uh, mostly students actually, um, who have provided us with their knowledge of archeological sites to provide pre-recorded virtual tours for people on site. Um, one of those archaeologists is uh, Buhu from Yale University, um, who works actually in the Gobi Desert on a Bronze Age site. And uh, Buhu was uh, really great with uh, connecting us with the information as he was the archaeologist who actually excavated the site. And um, this particular model is in the middle of the Gobi Desert, um, very difficult to access. And uh, we were able to generate the 3D model from only 35 photographs of the site. So we use a lot of the technologies that are already out there in the field. Um, this particular one was created with an aerial drone, which you see very often in, in the field as archeologists. And uh, you just snap a couple photos. Um, the further away, actually, the better. I accidentally digitized like a huge part of St. Peter's when I was trying to take a picture of a door. Um, so sometimes the bigger the object and the further away, the more patterns it has, the better it actually works out as a model, which is pretty incredible. Um, so we're hoping that this will eventually work its way into like the regular work procedures of archaeologists on site. It's very quick to do. It's very easy to do. Um, and it only takes about a few minutes, either before or after an excavation, preferably after, after you've kind of cleaned up a little bit. And you just walk around, snap a few photos, or if you have an aerial drone, snap a few photos, plug it into a photogrammetry software, and then it builds the model for you. And that's usually the workflow that most of these archaeologists are practicing. Um, but the question or the, the pain point that we're solving is where do those go and how are those experienced uh, by publishing them in a way that can be kind of felt face-to-face uh, -face in a way. Um, so some of the functionalities that we have um, outside of the virtual tour guides who actually you know, talk to you and explain the site. Um, we have taken a social media approach um, to sharing information. So one of those things is we wanted to create user-generated posts in three-dimensional space. Um, and my teammate, uh, Manon, was brilliant with coming up with that solution. And so essentially what we've done is instead of taking a social media post where you can you know, comment on your friend's picture of a cat, <laughs> uh, what you can do now is you can do that, but standing in an archaeological site. So you can hold the controller, pull the trigger, or press the button, and then it will create what looks like a green dot. And uh, then you can type a comment with a virtual keyboard, publish it, and then later somebody else can read it and then spatially reference it by seeing kind of where this green dot is in the scene. Um, so that's valuable, obviously, because you can talk about different parts of any 
model published in the platform, but you also create dialogue. And that's what we're hoping to do. Um, the internet these days is really just a, a battleground. <laughs> Everybody's fighting and doing stuff. So we're, we're trying to hope to create a space where people can add constructive ideas and share those ideas, no matter you know how they sound or, or what they are. Uh, we really want people to feel like they can learn about the information from the people uh, who are qualified to do it, maybe archaeologists or researchers, um, but also connect with them, ask questions, and, and pretty much do what they're doing right now on the internet, but up close face-to-face -face and with uh, credible information to actually learn about it. And, and that's what we're trying to, to really tackle. Um, so one of the ways that we're doing that is we provide access to uh, publicly accessible websites um, of those sites, and people can kind of scroll and read the information. And then we also, uh, to prepare for more and more sites, add a five-star rating quality, as some of the models don't look as good as others, you know, because there was a process to doing this. Um, so people can just get an understanding of, you know, is this a five-star site or, or whatever it is before they travel to it. Um, and it's currently single player, um, but we are hoping to make it multiplayer uh, eventually. We have it set up, but with VR, it's tricky because there's a lot of social and privacy issues. Um, it's different from just doing a call like this because when you are in virtual reality, you can literally get in somebody's face <laughs> and that can be very uh, abrasive for a lot of people. So before you can actually make these things multiplayer and throw in all kinds of components, uh, you have to add that comfort level so people can feel like you know they're safe and they don't have to worry about other players in the space because it is the internet. So you have to put those protocols in place first. Um, and that's what we're hoping to do uh, some point in the future uh, to make it more engaging. Um, right, so that's the majority of it. I could talk about more about what we're working on, um, but I also wanted to kind of show this quick video here like that. Um, so this is just kind of a quick screen video that actually I didn't edit, <laughs> I should have, um, that I took while wearing the headset. And uh, this is probably back in April. So it is gonna look much different. This is before we're adding the research center. Uh, we do have like a terms of service and privacy policy and all that you know essential nonsense that you have to put when you start creating platforms so the user will agree to that they will land right now on the moon uh, or what feels like the moon this will eventually become the abrob research center uh, we provide instructions on you know how to use the controls and all the essential stuff that you would get any kind of video game or platform and then you essentially can select a site uh, travel to that site uh, you know stand under it look at it, experience it, and of course, read about it. And uh, that's what it does currently. Um, we're, we've got a lot of big plans for it, but we are a very, very small team. So it does take us some time to kind of come up with uh, the means to, to finish these projects as we, we try to juggle a lot. So I'll just kind of go through a little bit here. Um, this is Hall of Ambassadors in Spain. Um, I like showing the site because it's actually where they filmed the Game of Thrones. Um, so what we're trying to do is really integrate things that interest people um, and people who mostly are gamers is, is our current you know, user base. Uh, but we're trying to get people excited about archeology span who may not been interested in archeology span or who are very interested in archeology span and don't have the means to either learn about it fully or access it, um, especially now with COVID. So we're trying to bring, bring those two markets together um, in a space. Um, we would like to eventually create like a mobile app for this and et cetera, et cetera, um, so that we can pull as many people in without you know, requiring too many pieces of hardware or, or whatever it may be. Um, and, and that's pretty much how it works right now. And uh, I'll just kind of wrap this up really quick here because there are some kind of neat features. Um, so you can scroll, read about the sites, uh, really, you know, have a look at things. And, and more importantly, you really do experience it. It really does feel like something is right in front of you and you can see it and you can almost reach out and touch it, uh, which is many of the things that we're trying to, to recreate at this time. Um, so anyways, here's the Game of Thrones reference. I just think that's fun, uh, which is why I like showing people that. That's just totally coincidence. <laughs> um, so a lot of these sites are you know, more famous sites um, in terms of how we uh, credit people. I think I kind of show this here. Um, you just kind of click on one of our buttons. Uh, this will eventually be upgraded to look a little bit nicer. Um, so if you want to read public information, that's accessible. If you want to know who made the site, that's accessible, uh, which usually takes you back to the Sketchfab account. If you want to know the Creative Commons requirements for these models, it's also accessible, uh, unless it was something that we paid for. And uh, that's usually our general workflow. Um, so we're just trying to do it is already available online, but trying to really bring it into a more uh, inclusive and interesting 
and and spatially. Sorry, I'm just going to skip ahead here. I know <laughs> there's a lot a uh, lot here. This is our virtual museum from Sweden, and uh, we're just trying to pull that into um, this growing technology um, that we we know is a growing uh, user base uh, as these headsets are becoming more and more accessible, and uh, we just really want people to get as excited as we do about archaeology uh, who maybe have thought about it or they've thought about it and they just don't know <laughs> or, or how to find the information or they don't have you know the time or or interest or whatever it is um and that's really the majority of it um there are human remains uh, as you may have seen there for a moment um so we do let people know that these are real human remains and they are treated with respect because they are published you can't really do anything with them except for annotate them um but again this is already information that's available online and we do provide access to as much as possible um yeah so i think i'll just kind of skip through here we have some miniatures as well um this is a unesco uh, cathedral in spain um so you can just kind of jump around the site it does look it will look a little bit different soon once we provided those kind of um updates but it is kind of it's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm probably spend more time in it than anybody. <laughs> um, to date, we have had about 1,200 people download it. Um, it's for free. Um, we're hoping to monetize it eventually, but I know there will be questions about that. The shorter answer is that we buy models. I buy models, and then we put them into the site, and then we provide like a small cost for those. Otherwise, all the sites in it right now are free. And my rule is, if it's free online, it's free in the platform. If it's not free online then that's an extra thing. Um, and that's really about it so far. And uh, here's a couple more sites. Again, I really have to edit this down. Um, there's a lot of information online as well. Um, Avrod.com is our website. We just upgraded a little bit. Um, I did make a promotional video, which is on YouTube. And I think in a moment, I will also drop my um, recent interview, uh, podcast interview, uh, which kind of talks a little bit more about photogrammetry. It's more uh, tailored for archaeologists, I would say, and, and how this is kind of used in the field and, and how it can be used remotely as well. Uh, so here's Boodoo. Um, I've recently changed his avatar, so it looks a little bit more like him. And uh, yeah, that's that's really the majority of it. So thank I guess, you. No thank problem. you so much. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for sharing all this information with us. And uh, I, I can sense the excitement flowing in our chats. And everyone is saying how much they used uh, virtual collections online during the quarantine for teaching purposes. But this is just pushing the technology uh, one step further. And uh, I can sense everyone is just as excited as I am. Uh, there is one question that came up uh, from Greta. And uh, due to time constraint, Greta, if you don't mind, I will just uh, summarize it and ask it here. So uh, we, we, of course, use uh, resources like Google Earth Pro and satellite images in our teaching. Um, but how do you how do you decide for Avroid? How do you decide on which monuments or which sites to focus on? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, usually it's just me in my apartment frantically Googling to see what's available. Um, and then if someone publishes something and it looks interesting, I'll put it into a list and then eventually if we get time, we'll, we'll update it. Um, yeah, so that's usually the workflow. Um, if it's available on Sketchfab, Sketchfab is a great website because it really operates kind of like a Google, but for 3D models. It's largely used for gaming, um, but there are tons and tons of links and references for real archeological sites that archeologists from universities and in the field are publishing themselves. So it is kind of growing that community as well. Um, but generally speaking with our user market, it's really gamers. So we try to find things that will pop out and interest thing or even uh, interest people. So we're even putting uh, a T-Rex skeleton in. And I know a lot of people are gonna say, well, that's not archeology, span I, I know. <laughs> but the point is again, a lot of people, including my friends and everybody, uh, you know, confuse those two fields. So what we'll do is we'll still provide access to scientific data. We had the Apollo 11, not exactly archeology span history as well and cultural history. Um, and so what we will do is educate them on the difference between those two fields. You know, this is a paleontological model because it's a dinosaur, it's in Avrod, but we do do fields outside of archaeology as well um, to really get people excited, uh, you know, um, who normally wouldn't get excited about archaeology and, and kind of bring them in that way. So that's generally the work process. Is, is this a big site? How does it look? Um, then if it's good enough or if I have time to make it, I'll put it into the platform. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, yep. Thank you so much, Jeremy. That's our last presenter today. Uh, unfortunately, we have to wrap this up, guys. Um, so 
Again, I just want to reinforce uh, that our goal of this roundtable is to hopefully bring some real actions uh, to promote diversity and inclusivity in the field of ancient studies. Um, and this presentation will be cut up into shorter, uh, in into small clips and make available for people who um, due to various uh, issues cannot attend, cannot join us today and for them to watch uh, afterwards. And we will also make the notes, uh, round table notes available. So if you prefer reading instead of uh, rewatching the videos, you can review them uh, afterwards. So finally, uh, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you for, um, I, I want to thank David, Christian, and Megan for getting me involved uh, at the very last minute, actually. Um, so thank you, everyone, for, for paying attention to us and being flexible uh, to the time change. So um, I'd just like to yeah. say one thing. I think uh, coming out of this, there was a lot of ground covered, and clearly we put too much into one uh, time slot. But, you know, live and learn. Um, but in any event, I'd like to send an email afterwards to, all, to the whole group together. And maybe we can keep growing um, on some of our ideas towards practical solutions in each of these different areas. Because it's, it's strange how many diverse things, the issues there are to deal with, with diversity. But I think uh, my approach is always go at it for a number, from a number of angles at the same time. So thank you all for being here. And I think we're gonna ask everybody to step out of the Zoom because we still have one more presentation in the conference after this. And I just want to add, I put in the chat, but thank you Lingxin so much for jumping in at the last minute. She was not our original moderator slated for today. Uh, and I know that Christian and David and myself, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you uh, coming in and, and doing this for us. Thank you for getting me involved. This is super fascinating. Uh